Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, the numbers are few at the moment. I think it's the clock change may have done something. Anyway, I think we should slowly start so we can carry on uh, and finish on time. So uh, we had to change the topic uh, because of uh, several requests as well as there was an important issue that uh, we had to talk. Um, this is about the war that has developed between Hamas and uh, Israel. So there's, sadly, there's a major impact on innocent victim on both sides. And they are the ones who really take having the brunt of it. And uh, it's not just limited to uh, just a small region. There's a world impact from all these wars now. So, so we need to understand how it might affect us as well. And also um, just what can we learn from this as well? So I will put just one slide as, at the end, and but it is open to discussion and see what we can learn when such a thing happens and how can we prevent such things happening as well. So the Israel Hamas issue is a very complex one and I don't understand all of it, but there may be uh, people in the audience who have actually visited Palestine, I've spoken to, and also who have visited Israel. So they have different points of view. And uh, the I think it's important that we understand a um, little bit about Israel, how it was formed, and then take it on from there to see what is really happening. A little bit about uh, the uh, Israel. This green is uh, the part that we are talking about. That's actually originally was Palestine. And then this is the Mediterranean Sea over there. You have the Egypt on the south here. Then Jordan there, Saudi Arabia here, and Iraq here and Syria there. So, so you can see the surroundings, so you can kind of map where all these things are happening. So let's listen to this video. I think it is about three or four minutes and then we can take it from there. Thank you. Palestine went from this to this and it didn't happen overnight. Up until the early 1900s, Palestine was part of the Ottoman Empire, a religiously diverse land where Muslims, Christians and Jews lived alongside each other. Then things begin to change. With the start of the Zionist movement in Europe, calling for the establishment of an independent Jewish state, ideally in Palestine, the first wave of European Jews start to immigrate. By the end of World War I, the Ottoman Empire collapses and Palestine is under British rule. It's 1917. Britain declares its support for a Jewish homeland in Palestine. The number of Jewish settlers grow, fueling tensions between the Arabs and the Jews. The violence between the two sides caused Britain to bow out and let the UN take over. The UN approves of a plan to split Palestine into two states, Jewish Israel, Arab Palestine. The city of Jerusalem, which is sacred to Muslims, Christians, and Jews, is now a UN-controlled international zone. Jews accept the UN partition plan and declare independence as the state of Israel, but neighboring Arab countries object to the land takeover. This marks the beginning of the first Arab-Israeli war. Israel is victorious and makes a grab for the land intended for the Palestinian state under the UN. The land gets divided into three parts. Jordan occupies the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Egypt occupies Gaza. And the state of Israel takes 78% of historic Palestine, including West Jerusalem. 700,000 Palestinians become refugees as a result and the day is remembered as a Nakba, the catastrophe. It's 1967. The Six-Day War breaks out between Israel and neighboring Arab countries, and by the end of it, the map looks something like this. Palestine is now fully occupied by Israel. Despite the absence of a formal peace treaty, things start simmering down. Then Israelis start settling into Gaza and the West Bank, resulting in an Israeli-Palestinian struggle that gives rise to the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Their main goal, to liberate Palestine from Israel by any means necessary. Fighting goes on for years. 
The PLO eventually accepts dividing the land between Palestine and Israel, but the conflict doesn't end there. More settlers make their way into Israeli-occupied Palestinian territories. The international community considers this illegal. The frustration of the Palestinians leads to an intifada. As a result, Hamas is born, a political movement determined to fight against Israeli occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. The United States, Israel, and the PLO signed the Oslo Agreement to split the West Bank into three sections. Area A, under full Palestinian control. Area B, under joint Palestinian-Israeli control, and Area C, under full Israeli control. But the solution creates a problem. Area C contains the majority of West Bank's agricultural land, water, and minerals. Palestinians have limited access to these. Further peace talks prove unsuccessful. Palestinians lose hope, resulting in the second intifada, and Israel begins building walls and setting checkpoints to control Palestinian movement. It's 2005. Israel withdraws from Gaza, but continues settlements in the West Bank. Hamas gains power in Gaza and splits from the Palestinian Authority, seeing it as being too secular. The West Bank and Gaza are now under separate leadership. Israel imposes a blockade restricting any form of movement by land, air, or sea. It's 2017, and this is the current situation of Palestine. There are solutions on the table, but will we see them implemented in our lifetime? I think uh, you had a glimpse of uh, what the situation there and the beginning of all this trouble. So it's a very long-term trouble that's been there. So going into that, so just if you summarize, uh, that's Israel, that's the West Bank, and this small strip is the Gaza Strip. So after the 1948 war, the Jordan took control of the West Bank and Egypt took control of the Gaza Strip. So that was done by Egypt. This was initially um, controlled by um, Jordan. The city of Jerusalem was split, which is uh, the Holy Land, with Jordan taking control of the East Jerusalem, while West Jerusalem was in Israel. Israel captured the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem during another war in 1967. Since then, Israel has set up many Jewish settlements, communities, some tiny, some as big as small towns in both the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. These settlements are now illegal, considered illegal under international law, although Israel goes does not agree with these things. So that's where it is. And the people in the West Bank, as well as Gaza, they've been un living under occupation. So the Palestinians in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, have lived under Israel occupation since 1967. Human rights groups have recorded widespread abuses by Israeli soldiers of Palestinians. For example, the Israeli army has put up a lot of checkpoints and roadblocks between villages and the towns. Palestinians say it makes it much harder to visit friends and family or get to work, school or hospital. Some Palestinians compare the restrictions on their lives to being in a prison. So the Israeli government says the checkpoints are to protect settlers and to prevent potential Palestinian suicide bombers from harming Israelis. So let's take the Gaza Strip. Their life for the many of the 2.3 million Palestinians who live in Gaza Strip is very difficult. It is a narrow piece of land along the Mediterranean coast and access to it is very limited. It is fenced in and Israel controls its coastline and all the entry and exit crossings into Israel. There is another crossing point into Egypt. There is no working airport. Because access is so restricted, not many goods get into, in, into or out of Gaza. Food is allowed in, but aid agencies say families are not eating as much meat or fresh vegetables as fruit as they used to. Uh, there are often power cuts as well. So large numbers of people have lost their jobs because businesses can get very few of their products out of Gaza to sell, and people don't have much money to buy things. So they're in a very difficult situation, and Israel withdrew all of its settlers and troops from Gaza trip. 
in 2005. So the that's the summary situation that is now. So this is Gaza, this is the sea, Mediterranean Sea, but no one has access to uh, Gaza uh, because at the north, that's the Israeli crossing, that's completely closed. The border is completely fenced. And this is the only entrance that is there is to the Egypt. But the water supplies, electricity supplies, and um, other things are all coming across these borders, and they've all been cut. And the hospitals, the main, main hospital that was in Gaza City has been already kind of demolished by whatever reason. Aid can't really get through, which is actually coming through only through the south. And the whole city, mainly the north of Gaza, is bombarded at the moment. So people in there is in real difficulty. And then at the moment, so the the current war was created because the Hamas fighters went into Israel and killed some 1,400 civilians. And it returned to bombing, according to the sources, there are about 7,000 people killed back in Gaza as well. So it's a really uh, sad situation. So in general, if you look at it, how these conflicts arise, the co different communities live together. So you start conflicts between them, usually because of a land issue or inequality. inequality. That's probably the main reason why you get conflicts between communities. And that's something that we have experienced in Sri Lanka as well. Now, this becomes an opportunity for divisive leaders. Divisive leaders, they only talk about division as the solution. And that can be based on race, religion, or caste. Then they take over these uh, communities. And then they will start representing these divisive leaders start uh, representing those communities. And their rhetoric is actually always inflammatory. They will try to blame the other part. They will try to accuse the other part and so on. So on both parties, what is proliferated in the community is aggression versus aggression. So this ends up in wars, maybe terrorist wars, normal wars, whatever. And what's the important thing is that the normal citizens who work, who peace-loving people, are actually the silent majority, but they don't say nothing. So they are the innocent victims because they have to pay for all these uh, wars because they are the ones who are funding the governments in whatever the sites. But then the, at the end of it, they are the ones who are in the crossfire as well. So they are the ones who have to die and then damage, uh, trauma, everything else. So it's really a difficult situation. So what we can learn is uh, that, you know, these things end up with corruption, lawlessness, poor education, healthcare, and no jobs, as, as I showed you on for Gaza as well. So it's a really difficult situation and, and the violence becomes kind of natural to resolve the issues. And then you end up with a failed state. So what we can do, I mean, we should try, if you want to avoid this kind of thing for any country, peace-loving citizens have to speak up and they must recognize the divisive leaders and don't support them. This is what normally happens. Divisive leaders are usually the ones who blame the other party or the community for the problems they have. They have nothing constructive. Everything what they talk is about destructive methods. And uh, they want a pound of flesh from the other side. That's what they want. There's no focus on the needs of the communities. Instead, they're talking all the problems are because the other part is not doing whatever. So they promote inequality and division. That's what the, these divisive leaders do. And they are corrupt. So, so that's where we will end up. So to prevent this kind of thing, the normal peace-loving people have a duty to speak up when you see such things. So that's what I think that we have to learn, but we are open to discussion now. Anybody who, I know there are people who visited uh, Palestine, visited Israel. I don't know whether they are there. 
but we are happy to have a little discussion on this and then conclude. I don't think the others are here yet who has visited the places. Anything, any comments from you all? Anybody? <laughs> anything we can do, anything we must do. I know we're very small, but still we can make a word or say something or try to at least, you know, consider or strengthen the uh, world uh, mission trying to achieve ceasefire and then allow at least the in the short term aids to the people who are currently severely affected by this inside uh, the Gaza, which is almost, it is actually now named as an open air prison because nothing is allowed to go through. Any comments from you all, anything at all? I'm sorry the speakers who may had more information is not here today at the moment. Um, Anything to say? Yes, Nirmalan, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not that I want to say this in particular, but uh, since everybody is very quiet, I'll just throw something in for discussion. And um, uh, what I would like to point out is that this particular problem, the, the Israeli-Palestinian problem, um, it seems to be quite different to these normal conflicts that we have of the same type. We have the same type of conflicts, but it seems to be quite different. Um, and what we see actually here is, um, if you look at the historical thing, if you look at what is, what is available, like uh, in this video, it mentioned the Zionist movement in, um, in, in um, uh, Europe mainly. Uh, I think it was Theodore Hetzel who was one of the people who pushed very hard, uh, who encouraged people to go and settle in an area of Arabia, which I don't think it was a country called Palestine at that time, but nevertheless, there was a mixed population there, as they said in the video, there were Jews, there were Arabs, and there were some Christians all living together, uh, not in separate states, but living together as one kind of society. And um, these people who went in there as settlers began, they brought with them a new lifestyle and they brought with them new technologies and they brought with them new knowledge. And um, they were focused on, let's say, to use the word development. So they organized themselves very quickly and became very highly productive. And then for, for some reason or other, they chose not to, uh, or they seem to have chosen not to try to spread that knowledge and that resources to the surrounding population as well and integrate them all in the common developmental program. They rather seem to have made every effort to develop themselves alone. And that started to breed a lot of resentment, which led to violence. The Palestinian people or the people who were living there started attacking these settlers. Now, the moment that happened, remember these people were coming um, motivated by uh, all kinds of discussions going on in Europe and even in, uh, I think, Russia, all over the place. So the people who were supporting them then naturally said, look, they are being attacked and something has to be done to protect them. This is not on. And as this discussion went on, that is how I see the UN having got involved and the UN, for whatever reason, decided to come out with these two states um, solution, which is where we are stuck at the moment. But also the, these roots of this um, this, this um, Israeli-Palestinian problem goes back, I mean, as in the case of many of these things, it's deeply um, rooted in religious beliefs, especially on the, on the Israeli side. And um, I don't really know how we are going to deal with that. That's where Zionism comes from, and it's very deeply rooted. And if you look at the way Israel has been continuing to to to, uh, re to break the promises that it has made at the UN, I really don't know what kind of interventions we can make. Yes, we can talk about humanitarian assistance, we can talk about a ceasefire, we can talk about peace. 
But underneath it all, what can we say about a long-term solution? I, I think you are absolutely right. And, and the United Nations, who knows particularly all the history, just managed to get, I think, a resolution yesterday, which was thought that they will not pass, because the Security Council did not pass a resolution for ceasefire. Uh, because, uh, again, these are controversial things, and the the US and UK did not support, a, I think, a ceasefire in the Security Council. But then when it comes to General Assembly, uh, it was all support. This was brought by Arab countries, and then it was supported by most, only I think 14 people voted against the ceasefire. So, so this shows the, how the General Assembly is feeling, and obviously the Security Council is not reflecting what the other people's feelings are. So, but the question is, this kind of thing will have major impact on everybody. Say this war can spread, the uh, cost of oil, etc., whatever can go up. The food availability may change and other violence issues may erupt in other countries, in neighboring countries, and also maybe in uh, other so-called peaceful countries. Now, yesterday there was a very, I think the largest uh, protest uh, to uh, was uh, by the Palestinian supporting people was held in London. That was one of the largest or the, or the largest in this issue. So there's a very large protest asking, the government to intervene and stop violence. So, so, so there's a division. So it creates a division in many countries, and then that might have other further implications as well. So, so this is the really bad situation that is there. Yeah. Anybody when else? You spoke, when you spoke of other countries, Tula, what came to my mind is there was an attempt. Apparently, I did not know this till very recently. There apparently was an attempt before Israel was formed to bring in Jews and settle them in Sri Lanka around uh, Trinkaman. And uh, after some searching, I found a document which seems to kind of uh, bear this out. There seems to, the colonial government seems to have had some plan, which fell apart, of course, once Israel was uh, declared as, as a country. No, I think these resolutions that were brought in or implemented has been a problem. And you can see it between Pakistan and India. It is a resolution that's completely gone wrong. And these are resolutions which should not understand whatever it is that's gone wrong. So without promoting peace, promoting division has not really helped in any of these states. Uh, Jeevananda has raised the hand as well. Jeevananda, yes. Yeah, thanks, Jula. So I think, you know, we can look at this in two ways. Two, two, we can divide it into two aspects. One is the uh, Palestinian problem itself. And the second one, as uh, Chula ended uh, uh, your uh, talk, uh, what can we as Sri Lankans learn from it? So I think the second one is more important for us. That as you know, as a small country, I don't see you know there's much that we can do to solve or contribute to solving the Palestinian problem. Now, going into the first part briefly, the this is not new in a way. I mean this. European invasion of native lands had been happening for hundreds of years. Well, uh, you know what happened in the US, the Native American populations were corralled into reservations now. Uh, they have very little say. Uh, same thing in Canada, probably Canadian, uh, Native uh, Canadians are in a little bit better off than the American counterparts. Uh, South America, now more recently, Australia, the Aboriginal populations are completely, totally marginalized. And then you know what happened in the referendum that was held uh, uh, two weeks ago. It was uh, the, the I, I cannot understand, you know, that was, they were asking for repre representation in the government. That was rejected. Uh, forget about, you know, giving their rights and whatnot, their land. So I think these things have been happening throughout the world. Fortunately, in Sri Lanka and places like Sri Lanka, India, and uh, the most of the Asian countries, 
the European, you know, they did their part of damage, but they left us alone after that. We are we are trying to uh, sort out the problems uh, they left. Uh, looking at those countries, the only success story I can see is South Africa. Uh, they found a reasonable solution to this uh, European invasion problem. So I think, you know, uh, that is when it comes to our Sri Lankan, our own problems, I think that's some place we can look into to learn uh, uh, what, what we can learn to solve, you know, our potential problems in, in Sri Lanka. I will stop there. Yeah, yeah, thanks, uh, Jiananda. And actually, the Mrs. Pille, I think, who is in the UN, who has been looking into this, has made a statement I heard this morning in Al Jazeera. And, and she was telling more things about the problems, how it has come up and so on. And uh, and the difficulties they have even now and then, and uh, she was she's originally from South Africa and then she mentioned the apartheid in South Africa when she was growing up, and then now she refers to the problem in Gaza as also a situation of apartheid, which was interesting. So so the question is that. Uh, our people, I mean, we we can get involved with this one way or the other as well, because we are also very good in creating issues for things that we have nothing to do with. And, and you know, somebody might go and protest in the embassies or something, and somebody else will have a fight and the government will put something. So we have to be careful as well. That's why I said we should not promote division as a whole because it's not going to solve any problems. So. <laughs> I I fully agree with you, Chula. I think, you know, in Sri Lanka, we have our own enough problems. Uh, <laughs> let's try to solve our problems rather than trying to uh, solve these uh, enormous, yeah. humongous problems that the world leaders cannot uh, Yeah, it's solve. not solved. We should not get involved with those. That's, I think, the way... We should do what happens is our people, there are people who like to put these forward and then have an argument and then create an issue in our own land as well. Lakshman has raised the hand, but Lakshman is not there. He probably got disconnected. Um, anything else we can say? So the only only hope that we can have about Palestinian situation itself is that the uh, within the occupied uh, area, the Palestinian, even within the Israel proper, the Palestinian uh, population will grow as we go. And then I can't remember the numbers. Uh, some point in the near future, they are going to be the majority. So at that point, you know, they will have a, democratically, they should have a uh, more say in, in the governance of the place. But uh, uh, the suppression, they will have to overcome the suppression. So that's why um, what Mrs. Pillay said about, you know, the, it's, it, it's a apartheid situation very similar to what happened in South Africa. And uh, probably they can learn some things from what happened in South Africa. Yeah, yeah. It's a very difficult, uh, sad situation, really. And then, uh, and what is important for us to understand is us, us means the silent you know, peace-loving people are the ultimate victims of this. They not only have to pay for all the costs, but also get involved in the crossfire. So they are the ones who get damaged, who lose their families and everything else. So, so really sad. And then, you know, even in Israel, um, the people who got um, arrested or, or taken away to Gaza are some of the people who were living in the border trying to create peace and resolutions with Gaza. So, so they are the peace-loving people who are now uh, hostages. So, so this is the kind of situation, and then we don't need to talk about the political backups, but I think there is a kind of a, a war-prone leaders who are kind of have been trying to promote it maybe differently because they've been harassing the... Um, the people by by various blocks and no opportunities, no jobs, 
and no electricity, no water, all these kind of things. And will trigger any normal person to go on a violent path. That's the issue. So, <laughs> so I, we can only feel very sorry, but we can be uh, supportive in whatever the way we can do. Yes, Nirmalan, you're there. Yeah. Um, it just struck me while I was listening to you that this is not the only problematic area where there is conflict and where peace is required. So people like you and I who are not militant combatants and, and not necessarily even pushing those hardline positions or even if we are, uh, maybe we can um, come together around um, one common sort of a demand or one objective that which is that problems whatever they may be, should not be resolved with, by resorting to violence. Maybe, I just don't know, but maybe we can push that slogan forward, which gives us a platform from which we can kind of voice our concerns. Yeah, that is true. I mean, after the Second World War, for example, Japan took that decision. So their uh, armies, they don't get involved with any other conflicts at all. So they've not gone to war anywhere. They don't say anything. They're only doing their job protecting that nation. So, so that's one decision that they have taken. And they have, they have followed that until now uh, in Japan. So it is possible to nationally make such decisions and say we're not getting involved with this. But then only there's a very few countries who are doing that. Lakshman, raise the hand. Lakshman, yes, Lakshman. Yes, Lakshman. Yeah, well, uh, thank you. I uh, got uh, disconnected. Uh, now I'm okay. Uh, yeah. I just have the one, one uh, issue only, uh, looking at the whole scenario of this uh, Israel-Palestine issue. Uh, the very basic question, what is the use of UN. What is the US uh, use of UN? Now, even with a two-thirds majority, uh, they have passed the resolution, but uh, what is the use of it? I mean, uh, there is no mechanism to impose it. UN doesn't have uh, army. I mean, uh, they used to have, I mean, from uh, collecting from uh, various uh, different countries, but uh, in a situation like this, uh, I mean, it's a huge uh, arms uh, involvement and big superpowers are involved. So passing even a two-thirds majority resolution by the UN, what is the end use? What is the use of it? What is the having U UN if they can't interfere in a situation like this uh, actively? So it's a basic question. Yeah, I don't know. United Nations, I mean, if you look at the funding that comes to United Nations, the highest funds come from... US, I think, to support the whole of United Nations. Yeah. And the other countries pay small amounts of money. So, and also then there is an issue with the Security Council because they are thinking, I think there are three nations or someone who can veto, who can veto all the decisions. So Security Council can't take much of a decision. And its chairperson is now, I think, uh, from Russia, which is also now involved with another war. So it's very complex situation. I mean, United Nations is like, for example, uh, if you take our own country, it's like our kind of Supreme Court, isn't it? But then we are now questioning whether they are allowed to make the decisions properly or not. So, so it's a very complex situation. So, but I think United Nations is trying to do what they can do, at least provide aid, provide uh, uh conscious talk and uh, and also these resolutions and and even you know collecting or defining war crimes etc cetera, etc cetera. so at least there's some mechanism towards the other party but if the un is not there then who is going to talk this be no one will be nothing and everybody will do what they want to do so but strengthening the un is probably something you have to do but then UN was formed in 1948 or something, but then hold that resolution or whatever the act that formed it will have to upgrade itself now. So that's what is probably needed. Yeah, it's a problem of uh, implementing the UN decisions. Yeah. Well, we have the same thing, don't we? Our constitution is not implemented in Sri Lanka. So, 
So uh, UN might be having the same problems worldwide, but at least it is there. And then certain actions have taken place, like, you know, the war criminals and so on being arrested when they are like 80 years, 90 years or whatever. So, so and some action taken and then there is the International Criminal Court and all that. So those things are there. They're not very strong yet, but something is there. But I think on the other hand, I think it's better we preserve that at least as it is rather than to just say useless and then have nothing. Because like us, we'll be a small country, won't it? As, as uh, Nirman said, if they say, okay, Israel has to go to Sri Lanka, we'll be just dump, won't it? <laughs> so I don't know. Anyway, very difficult situation. But I think the important thing is, you know, as as silent majority, we need to not promote division. That's what that ends up like this years later. Uh, Jivananda, yes, Jivananda. So uh, generally, the uh, everybody thinks that you know US has a bigger responsibility and major role to play in this issue. Um, I think you know, in all fairness, uh, at least certain uh, US administrations have tried their best to find a solution. Um, I'm referring to Clinton era. Uh, Clinton tried his best to uh, find a solution. Uh, he got the Israelis to go back to the pre-1967 borders. But unfortunately, Arafat didn't agree to it because he kept pressing for the return to right. If you may remember, I mean, this was like, what, 20 years ago. So uh, I think, you know, the unfortunately... Of course, you know, any, any country's foreign policy is focused on the uh, maintaining their own interest, uh, the, the view of the majority of their population. So uh, we cannot blame, uh, we, we, we should not uh, blame, blame the country's uh, foreign policy. It's uh, mainly for their own interests. But when the uh, uh, opportunities were given, unfortunately, the Palestinians because of the leadership at that had at the lack of leadership uh, or the representation of the uh, popular view by the leadership uh, failed those uh, attempts you know if you read uh, clinton's what clinton wrote after he left uh, the presidency he was very disappointed with the way the palestinian uh, organization uh, uh, participated in the peace talks and uh, obama of course tried to do uh, something but unfortunately, he did not have a partner uh, from the uh, Pal Palestinian side. Uh, he was, of course, you know, uh, Netanyahu and Obama, as you know, were at each other's throat. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Obama didn't have a partner in, on the Palestinian side. And uh, uh, the what followed, I hate to talk about, you know, the administration that followed, you know, that was, you know, just uh, driven by personal uh, son-in-law's uh, ideas. Uh, and uh, 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 Biden, if you listen to the political commentators, he is doing a his best under the circumstances. What they say is that, you know, he's giving the uh, full support to Israel, but at the same time, behind the scene, uh, what they say is that you know he's giving a tight hug to Israel, so that uh, the what you see from outside is that you know they are embracing each other, but by uh, giving a tight hug, he's also controlling their uh, ability to do too much uh, damage. So we will we'll have to wait and see you know what uh, how things develop. Yeah, yeah. I mean it is true, but. Uh... Then there are business partners, aren't there? When there's a war, lots of people <laughs> benefit from the money and the expenses, which are not really accounted that well. And then it carries on. So this is the problem. And then even the, even the, I think I heard a news report about how Hamas is paid. The money actually goes through Israel to Hamas to pay their recruits. So <laughs> something like that I heard. So. 
Yeah, so, you know, going back to our situation, Sri Lankan situation, you know, uh, alluding to what uh, Nirmalan said, so uh, that's what Nirmalan said is, you know, the Gandhian principles, you know, that's what uh, Mandela followed in, in the uh, South Africa. Uh, we, now we have, I think what we can do is to find partners in our opposing fractions, whether it's religious, language, cultural, or whatever, uh, we have to have uh, the, I'm saying, you know, what uh, Nirmalan says in the different uh, terms, uh, continue to have a stronger dialogue between the, our counterparts, you know, who are rational thinkers on the other side and uh, try to find solutions. Yeah, yeah, that is true. I mean, the partnerships come from talking to each other. And it's quite quite good to see that such partnerships develop. I must say I witnessed one event which I was lucky enough to be there. And uh, the, uh, the army commanders, oral commanders from Pakistan and India were sitting on the same table and having lunch. I was just next to next table and I was it was a pleasure to see that so then they know each other so if there's an issue they can ring each other and find out what exactly we should do so if they're peace loving people then the wars don't erupt so so as you say you know connectivity is important <laughs> so anyway so it's a short discussion today but i thought it's important to take it up so we recorded it and you can circulate to anyone and and say you know these are the issues that we need to think about at least all right so i think i'll stop there today and then uh, we will meet up uh, next week we're going to talk about um, uh, sri lanka's dairy farming issues and uh, hopefully i'm planning that there'll be some letters about the meritocratic uh, uh, system or election system uh, that we will be sending some letters to part leaders and so on. And these will be made public. Oh, I'll at least copy it to you all once it's all gone. So 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 that everybody is informed about what is happening. So so thank you again. And so we are trying to do what we can do. So if you have any ideas on this issue in Gaza, what we can do, even in a very tiny scale, just let us know. We'll see whether we can take it forward. Have a good day and thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chula. Thank you.